good morning, everyone. Morning, Doug. We're so very glad to have you here this morning on this cool October morning. Amen. I um, want to go ahead and mention just a few announcements to you as there's a lot going on this month of October. Uh, first off, I uh, want to encourage you to be in prayer for the Honduras team. Uh, they have a 6 p.m. meeting today. Is that right? That's what I heard. Okay, possibly. We'll see. Anybody on that team? Anybody on that team? Yeah. All right, so um, I think... Uh, they're gonna, they got a lot of stuff going on because our Honduras team leaves on the 13th at the end of this week. So do want to encourage you to be here tonight, Honduras team. Church I think the church is. Well, I think uh, I think the church is going to come and pray over them. Okay. That's what that is. Church is going to be praying over them. So would encourage y'all to be here. Uh, also, do want to remind our budget and finance team that you have a meeting on Monday at 6 p.m. So please be aware of that. You might be saying, well, hey, I'm not on that team, brother Dustin. That doesn't really matter to me. Well, hey, want to encourage you to be in prayer for our finance team, the men and the women on the team that God has placed there to help us be good stewards of what he's blessed us with. We want to make sure it goes to the gospel. So let's keep that up. Uh, also want to remind uh, anyone, if you would like to attend the Jackson County Baptist Association's annual meeting, that's going to be Tuesday, October 10th, 630 p.m at Pine Lake Baptist Church, and so uh, I think many of us staff are going to be there, uh, but it's welcome to any members of the Southern Baptist uh, Church in Jackson County. It's kind of a cool thing. That's when you get to meet the new pastors, the new missionaries that are being sent. You get to hear about new churches being planted, and so it's just a great time of worship, and you are more than welcome to join that. Uh, also want to remind you about our Honduras mission trip that's coming up, of course, October 13th through the 19th. Uh, be in prayer for our team because I believe they're uh, holding a revival. They're doing street evangelism. They have programming for children and the ladies over there as well. And so they're going to pack all of that into just one week. So I would encourage you to be in prayer uh, for them. And I also want to remind you that today you're going to get to see uh, another baptism. We've been having a lot of baptisms and uh, new members join. And so that's always an exciting time, not because uh, Ridgely Heights is uh, doing anything perfect, but because we serve an awesome and almighty God. And I don't know about you. How many of you were in small group this morning? This isn't me judging you. This is me just <laughs> show. I'm, I'm just asking. Listen, uh, if you're not a part of our small groups, you're really missing out on a blessing. Amen. Uh, one of the beautiful things we read in our small group this morning in, in Luke chapter 8 around verse 19 is when uh, Jesus is being followed by thousands and thousands of people. He's at his height of popularity. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a priest or a prostitute. You want to meet with Jesus and hear from him. And during that time, while he's surrounded by thousands, uh, his family is at the edge of the crowd. Of course, Mary and his brothers trying to reach out to him so much so that one of the disciples notices them on the edge of the crowd, runs to them, and they're like, hey, we really want to see uh, my son. We want to see our brother. And, of course, the disciple runs to Jesus and says, hey, Master, just to let you know, your family is here, and they would love to see you. And Jesus comes off a little cold because his words are that, well, those around me, they're my family. The, the ones who do what my father asks of me. They're my family. And you know, when you first hear that, that sounds a little cold, right? Moms, you don't want your kids to not respond to your text. You want them to answer. You want to see them uh, to let them to let you know that they're still okay. And I don't think Jesus is coming across as cold. He's not saying his family isn't his family, but he is looking around and saying, you, you're my family. And I want you to think about that this morning. Family is a complicated word, right? It can bring up a lot of laughter. It can bring up a lot of pain. Sometimes it doesn't bring up a whole lot of emotions because maybe you didn't have a lot of family, but we serve a risen Savior. He's not bound by the laws of genetics or, or of culture or of this world. And think about that, that everyone in here this morning, he would call you son. He would call you daughter. And it's not that he's excluding anyone. But that he looks at you and he looks at I. And he says, you, I've chosen you to be my family. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we are so excited to worship you here today. 
God, I ask that you would be with our musicians and our singers, God, as they lead us into worship. God, may we not lift up a perfect note to you, but God, may we lift up a complete heart to you. God, I lift up those who are gathered here with their families. God, I lift up the children who are uh, in their own service across the way. God, I lift up the little bed babies in the nursery. God, I lift up our countless volunteers who are giving of their time, their energy, and their strength, God, to see others come to a saving knowledge of you. God, I, I lift up the older. I lift up the younger. I lift up the singles. God, we lift up those who are in relationships. Father, we thank you for the privilege of even calling you Father. We love you so much, but it's only because you first loved us. God, may we never lose that picture of your love and your sacrifice on our behalf. And God, may you receive our worship with a full heart. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come on. Uh, you know, a week before last, I kind of challenged the church here to give to the Margaret Lackey Fund. I kind of looked around and I said, I think each one of you ought to be able to give at least $10. Well, as of last Sunday or last Wednesday night, our goal was $1,500. As of last Wednesday night, we had over $2,500 <laughs> in, in the offerings. Okay, so praise the Lord and thank you. Well, that'll work. You should have said $20. There's no telling what you got. How about Let's stand together this morning as we begin to worship our Lord and Savior. He is worthy.
set me on fire. Here I am, God. Arms wide open. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. My heart. My circumstances or feelings have not changed God. I can't do nothing to change God. He's the same God today as he was when he hung the stars. He's the same God that led the Israelites through the Red Sea. And he fed 5,000 people. But what he can do, he can change men. And he has changed men. And I praise God for that. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. God, thank you for the blessings you give each one of us. God, I thank you that we live in a country that we can openly say the name of Jesus and praise your name without persecution. God, thank you for this church, what it means to the community and to me personally. God, I ask you to be with the service today as we go through that people's lives will be changed and we can be a better person tomorrow than we were today. We'll give you praise, honor, and glory for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is Jackson Goff. I've only known Jackson Goff all of his life. <laughs> he is my next door neighbor. And uh, one of the things I remember through all the, all the years is whenever I would come riding my bicycle back to the house or I'd come up with the car, uh, he and his brother would always wave and say, Hey, bro, Steve! So he is my buddy. And I've learned a lot from watching this guy. And he, I even got to talk with him a couple of years ago in vacation Bible school, and he had made a decision that he wanted to follow Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and, and he decided that now was the time for him to follow in baptism. So that's what he wants to do. So Jason, uh, uh, Jackson, if you'd step up just a little bit. There you go. Jackson Goff, upon your profession of faith, as Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He also wants to be a member of Regional Heights Baptist Church. So all of those in favor of him being a part of the family of God here say amen. 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 Right. All right. So you are now a member of Regional Heights Baptist Church. Uh, I'm proud of you and who you are. And I'm going to ask Brother Dalton, as I always do since he sits right here, to pray for He's the deacon that sits closest to me. Oh, well, Cameron, I didn't see you there, man. Uh, but uh, Brother Dalton. Thank you for everything. 
Amen. What a beautiful thing water left in that baptistry, huh? If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've never been baptized, I can't think of a better place to do it than right here, right? So uh, if you need to be baptized, you come talk to my preacher. people say like a new song for us but if you listen to the radio you probably heard it but, uh, what beautiful words if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior guess what <laughs> how I long to breathe the air of heaven do you long for that where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with 
We give you all glory and all honor and all wisdom and power belongs to you. And for that, we're so grateful. We thank you that you bring us to places in our lives where we can cope in worlds at a world that is filled with sin. I pray that you might afford me an opportunity to speak to those who are in marriage or those who have come out of marriage or those who will one day be married today. I pray that I might be able to speak to them through what your scripture says about husbands and wives. I do pray that the clarity of this would be brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit that rests inside of each person who is here today. Lord, I pray that our concentration would be focused completely on you and that your word would be planted in our hearts in such a way that we will walk away from the word refreshed and made a new creation. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Okay, let me test and see how many of you are happy to be here today. Okay, I'm assuming the others are not happy. You're here by the duress. But thank you for choosing to be with us today. Uh, if you keep really, really good records, you will figure out that the outline that I used for this message I preached in 2014, as a message that I pulled back because I wanted to refresh it and share with it again because I think it does us a lot of good to understand what the Bible has to say about marriage. So I'm going to be talking specifically to husbands and wives. But I also want to say that I'm going to be talking to those who might ever marry a husband or a wife. And I even want to talk to those who have been through marriages and maybe things fell apart and didn't work the way they should. This may help you understand why some of the stuff went the way that it did. 
in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 5, and I think we're going to start there about uh, verse 25 or so, and look at a couple of words of Scripture, I think it will help us to understand who God is better and who that, how God pl works in the marriage. Now, what I want you to take away from the message today, and you might want to write this line that I've got on the screen behind me down in the corner of your Bible somewhere and see that love and respect... In fact, would everybody please say love and respect? Love and respect. Now, you're thinking in terms of love and respect come going together to make the marriage. Well, that's not really where I'm going. I'll explain that to you in a minute. But love and respect are key elements that unlock a sound, happy marriage. Uh, God has blessed me with being married for 43 years, and, uh, and I think he's blessed Tynell. I think Tynell is not here today. We've got some grandchildren in the house, and we had one of them who got sick during the night last night. So she's doing the, the grandma thing, taking care of that. So uh, she's not here, so I find that that will make me be able to speak freely about how <laughs> awesome her husband is, and she won't be able to talk about it. No, I'm just kidding about that. She's watching this on TV. Well, I didn't see anybody sitting at the desk, so I didn't know if we actually went out or not. So uh, today we will look at one of God's key elements in marriage. And if this element is missing, if it's not there, the marriage is destined for failure. Do you hear me? If these two things we're going to talk about are not there, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, the marriage is going to fall apart. But with it, and with a deep abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, a couple will find joy unknown that cannot be known even by the lost world in a marriage relationship where the relationship is good. Christ alone, Christ along with love and respect produces a marriage that cannot be separated. In fact, it was Jesus who said, what God has joined together, let no man, what? Separate or put asunder or break up. Uh, we hear a lot of that in the wedding vows that we have. Well, this in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25, God is going to show us part of why that works the way that it works. There, I, 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 don't, I want to remind you that there was one time a wife who said to me, or no, she didn't tell it to me, her husband had said this, uh, he had a wife who was unhappy in her marriage. And I wrote down what she said. She said, let us pray. He, she was talking to her husband. She says, let us pray that one of us will go home, and she was speaking about the heaven. Let us, let us pray that one of us will go home so that the other can be happy. She says, then I want to go live with my sister. Think about that for a minute. All right, having said all that, let's go ahead and read the text here. It says um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, and, and take note that there are about uh, four verses, five verses of Scripture here that are specifically for the husband and only one for the wife. So the key, I'm going to go ahead and say this. The key to a successful marriage lies in the husband. And the scripture here will help you be able to see that and why that is. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and give himself and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Now I want you to notice what he's saying. He's making a comparison between marriage and between the church who is ultimately the bride of Christ. So he's putting these two together and he says if you want a sanctified church, you've got to love the, the, the Jesus would have to love the body like he loves uh, and show that love by being crucified on the cross. So he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. So we have a husband who is Jesus to the church who is loving his wife and is loving his wife by letting her see the word lived out in his life because Jesus Christ is the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Verse 27, so that he might present the church, but now the analogy here is the wife, the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. 
Okay? I want you to see the church is able to be presented before God as holy when we get to the end of this thing. When we get to the end of our lives, the church will be perfectly holy because of how Jesus Christ loved the church. Okay? Understand that. In the same way, now see this is where he's putting them together and gluing it so that you'll see this. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now what he's fixing to come back and say, he's going to talk about one flesh. So when you're married in the spiritual union, the two become one. Going on with the text, it says in verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Now maybe you can see a little problem with marriages. You ever think there's been a husband and wife that hated each other? Absolutely. Why does it fall apart? It falls apart because they're not loving like Christ loves. Just as Christ does the church. Verse 30. Because we are members of His body. So here's the analogy again. You as an individual are not the church at Ridgely. The church at Ridgely is an accumul accumulation of all of the bodies. So the whole group of us makes the church the church. A husband and a wife are not really a husband and a wife. They're one unit that's been designed by God to be able to share the union of love between the two of them. Verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You're going to melt down until you want. This mystery is profound. Now the lost world can't figure it out. It's profound. And I am saying that it's, it refers to Christ and the church. Now, he's really talking about Christ and the church, but he's letting you see that marriages work the same way. Now, the key to the message today is found in verse 33. So you may want to highlight this one. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Okay? He's writing to the men at uh, uh, Ephesians, at the church at Ephesus, and he says to those men, each one of you love your wife as you love yourself. And then look at the second half. And let the wife see that she, now what's the next word? Respect her husband. And there's a huge difference between love and respect. Lord God in heaven, give me the ability to show these folk today what you want them to see. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Now, I say that, and I want to begin uh, with some, some facts about biblical marriage that attempt to show husbands how to love their wives and then show wives how to show respect to their husbands. So right off the bat, the first thing I want to talk about is this. Both love and respect are commanded in Scripture. Both love and respect are commanded in Scripture. That verse of Scripture that we just say, read right there said, each one man, talking about that, is love his wife, and then, it, then he tells the woman to respect her husband. So if you don't pull anything else away from this today, men, the main goal that you have in your life, in a marriage, is to make sure that your wife knows that she is loved by you and you love her in the same way that Christ loved the church. Now, how did Christ love the church? He did two things. Uh, he, he died and he gave himself. I got two answers right there. Both of those answers are exactly right. Jesus never spoke a word, never did a single thing that the Father didn't tell him to do. So he lived the perfect life. The other thing is, is he said you've got to be willing to die. So in other words, Jesus had to die so that the church could be united with, with God himself when we'll all be together in heaven. Husbands are commanded to love their wives. Uh, husbands are commanded to love, and wives are commanded to respect. A husband should respect his wife, and a wife should love her husband, okay? But there is no command in Scripture for the wife to specifically love her husband other than the general love to love everybody. So in other words, the wife is called to love her husband just like, the, just like all the people in church tell them to love the husband, okay? That, there's no command for that, okay? Love her husband apart from that general call. 
Now, so we know that we're supposed to do two things. Men are supposed to show love to their wives, and wives are supposed to show love, uh, show respect to their husbands, and this is a command that comes from God. Here's the second thing about that. Both love and respect are unconditional. They're totally unconditional. You are to love, a man is to love his wife unconditionally. A woman, a wife, is to respect her husband unconditionally. That means men, your wives, do not have to be, do not have to earn your love. You love them simply because you are their husband. And a wives can understand what I'm talking about when I say that. Because wives know that they are imperfect and they live in great fear that one day they will do something to stop you from loving them, right? Okay, if you can stop loving your wife, guys, you're not loving them the way that God has called you to love. So it's unconditional. Maybe I can understand, maybe we can understand a little better like this. When you have a baby that comes into the world and the, the mom gives birth to a child, she loves that baby. Amen, mamas? How much do you love those children? With every ounce of your being, and you love them more than more than anything you can think of off the top. You have maybe the relationship with your husband, or maybe you, maybe the love for Jesus Christ. But you love them, and there's nothing that 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 child can do to stop you from loving them. That's what unconditional is. Now let's let's flip it around so the wives will understand this. Your husband is not craving your love. Your husband is craving your respect. And if you give him your respect, he will feel like he's loved by you. But he doesn't even understand what love is when you can't show him the type of respect that he requires, which is the type of respect that we see that comes from the Scriptures. One does not have to deserve love or respect, but God requires the wife to respect her husband, and he requires the husband to love his wife. Now, love is the native language of women. They come into this world, since a mother gives birth to a child, they know to love. It's, it's been built in their DNA by God. But on the flip side, men don't feel that way. Men don't just love everybody. I mean, when a man sees his baby for the first time, and he looks at that baby, and he says, Oh, this is the most beautiful, precious thing I've ever seen. In the back of his mind, somewhere's going, Is his head supposed to look like that? <laughs> All right, now he learns to love that child, and it grows over a period of time. But a little while, you know, it's not like the mother stuff. It's, it's not built into his DNA, but built into his DNA is to immediately recognize any wife that does not respect her husband. And if you ask any man, he can tell you whose wives don't respect their husbands by the way they say, the things they say. Disrespect, and I want to make, I know this is a strange statement, but I want to make several of them to try to help it stick. Disrespect by the wife will not lead a man to love her. His wife, uh, disrespect will not lead a man to love his wife, nor will being unloving cause a wife to respect her husband. So there's a relationship between the two of these things. Husbands, a husband is unable to communicate love to his, a husband who is unable to communicate love to his wife is causing his wife to be miserable. A woman who loves her husband but withholds respect is leading the husband to store up wrath that will one day be released on that wife. Okay? Now, that's, that's the facts I want us to get. So then we have to, we have to look at this. How does, how does a man love a woman? Because the men need a little help with that. So how a husband can love his wife. That's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. And I do want to say that each one of these, this is not true for the wives, but it is true for the men. Each one of these is one of the very things that we're supposed to do to love God at the same time. So, here we go. How does a husband, uh, how can a husband show love for his wife? Number one, he's got to emphasize to her that the two are one. Remember what the text said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall they become one flesh. So the husband's job to help the woman understand this, that he loves her, is you've got to be connected to her. 
So much so that you can't be torn apart from her. Because if she feels that you can be torn apart from her, she's never going to feel love. So whenever you, whenever you say things like, well, I just think we probably need to call this marriage quits or whatever, you have just showed her that you do not love her. Whenever you talk about not the two of you together in, in tandem working through this process of life, and you say, well, well I'm just not going to have anything. You're going to live here, but we're just not going to have anything to do with it. Which says, I don't love you, Okay. Uh, one, uh, um, husbands are commanded to love and wives are commanded to respect here. Okay, okay. And going on here, it says, the, make your wife feel that you are mates, that the two of you are brought together for one purpose, and that is to glorify God. She is your other half. And that's the reason the scripture tells us what it is. A man must learn to use language both in public and in private that communicates that each of you are half of the whole. Now, when I introduce my wife a lot of times, you know what I add to that? And I truly mean this from the bottom of my heart. I would like for you to meet my wife, my wife who is my better half. You know why I say that? Because she is the better half. I don't just say those words. I absolutely mean those words with all I have. You need to be able to, guys, you need to be communicating whatever way you can. You need to let your wife know that you're a team. This is not you and me against the kids. I mean, it's us working things out and trying to figure out the kids. We're one flesh. We're a mate. We're a team. We're a unit. We, we, are, we are not me and you. We are, uh, we're, we is me and you. We're us. You see the words we put together? We're a couple. It's we and it's us and we're a couple. So why, your wives need to know. Wives, if you would like to know that you are really connected that way with your husband, would you please say amen? Amen. All right. It's true whether they'll admit it or not. Now, a man must speak and act in ways that show unity and relationship. Everything is about relationship between a husband and wife. It's all about the relationship. Okay, so that's why they do what they do. So find ways to communicate your oneness that you have with them. Here's the second one. Be open. Be open. Now, now listen closely to what I say. Now, this sounds a little tricky, but guys, guys, you listen close. You're going to get this. Be completely open. Be an open book when you are being read. Right, did y'all get that? Be an open book. I'm not telling you that you tell your wife everything that you know because everything that you know might make your wife feel bad. If somebody says something bad about your wife, do not come home and say, let me tell you what so-and-so said about you and you underload what she said. Wives, how does that make you feel when that happens? I got a rough crowd with the wives today, I can tell you that. All right, they're going to feel torn up on the inside because their lives are built on relationships and something's tearing the relationship up in there. we got to be completely open, but only when we're being read. You don't have to tell everything, but when she asks you something, you must speak the truth in love. When your wife genuinely wants to know why you are mad at her, and you know that if you tell her why you're mad at her, it's going to break loose and you're going to fight for four days... You know what you have to do, man? You got to tell her. You got to have the fight. You got to walk through it. And God holds you responsible for that, but God wired you in such a way that you can deal with it, even though you think you can't deal with it. If she knows that you have a secret, she will, she will feel, listen to this, if you're withholding information that she wants to know, she feels like you don't love her. Because if you loved her, you would tell her. Makes no sense in the male brain, but it makes absolute sense in the female brain. You must be open. I don't even. I, I, you must be open about your feelings, even if you know it will lead to an argument. All right? So you've got to be ready for that. You've got to be ready for that confrontation. And by the way, without some kind of confrontation, the marriage is never going to grow like it should. And I'm not talking you've got to scratch each other's eyes out, but you've got to talk about tough stuff. Okay? So you got to be open, guys. All right, here's the third one for guys. Let her see you trying to understand. But let me, let me, before I do that, let me, go, let, me go, let me go back to emphasize oneness. You know, when we come to know Christ, we are one with Christ because it is Christ who lives in us. 
When we come to Christ in prayer, do we hide things from God in prayer? Or do we open up and tell God everything that there is going on in our lives? All right, now, let her see you trying to understand. Now, let me tell you something. Before, let me connect this to God before we get any further. You will never understand everything that God understands, all right? But that doesn't, that doesn't stop you from trying to get to know who God is. So the better you know Him, the more you understand. Let your wife see that you're trying to understand. You will never completely understand the wife, but women are very compassionate when, uh, when you don't understand them. A woman is not as concerned about you understanding her as, as she is seeing you trying to understand her and that she's got something going on here. Now, why is that? Sometimes, guys, you need to know this. Sometimes they don't understand themselves. Now, the wives don't even look over here now. But sometimes none of us understand ourselves. Sometimes the wife's upset and she don't even know why she's upset. She's just upset, you know. I can't explain all that, but I can tell you this. Your job is not to figure them out completely from head to toe. Your job is to try to figure them out from head to toe and understand it. And they will see that. You get, listen guys, this is, this is the bottom line. You get points for trying, even though you don't get it right. Understanding her is a lifelong process of hit and miss. You know, you may get something right today, but tomorrow in a different situation, that same truth is not true at all times and all situations. Never give up. It's worth the effort. Because what's on the other side of all of this is something that most people never understand. Okay, So, let her see you trying to understand. And the, the third one is this, guys. Communicate loyalty to her. You Let her know your love for her is unconditional. We talked about that. You will always love her regardless of her shortcomings. And she has shortcomings, and she knows she has shortcomings, but she got to know that even when she slips up and she does the wrong thing, you still love me. That's because, you, you, here, here's how you know what I'm, I, what I'm saying is true. Guys, you've been in an argument with your wife, and she did something, and you want to point out to her that she did something, and before the conversation is over with, you may argue and fuss and all this, but sooner or later she's going to say, you still love me? If a guy has ever heard, do you still love me from his wife, would you please say Amen. Y'all are a rough crowd today. <laughs> this is so sensitive, y'all don't even want to speak out loud. But that's how you know it's true. It's because they want to know, do you still love me? And the bottom line is, baby, I love you no matter what you do. I'm mad as a hornet right now, and I'm aggravated that you towed the car out, but I'm not, I'm not going to divorce you because you towed the car out. You know, That's just an example. I'm not saying women are not bad. I think women are probably better than anybody today. Let's, uh, okay. The fourth thing you want to do, is it getting hot in here or is it just me? Okay. All right. The fourth thing you want to do is esteem her. Esteem her is not the same thing as loyalty. It's just a little different. Esteem her. Let her know that no other woman above is above or beside her. There's nobody that compares to her in situation. That you love her and not somebody else. What you don't do is walk through the mall and say, how come you can't look like that? Now that's called stupidity. In her mind, it had nothing to do with her dress. You just say, you think hubba hubba when you look at her, you think you look at me and you think, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, so. All right, you, you esteem, you got to esteem them with everything that you got. You let her know that there's nobody else that is equal to her and stands in that position. For me, as in my marriage, my daughter knows that I love her unconditionally, but she also knows that I love her wife, my wife, even more than her. Because my daughter is my daughter. But when it comes to my wife, she and I are one. And I'm selfish. I love myself. And the, part, the most thing I love best about myself is my wife. Because it is the better half. Okay, here's the last one. Guys, this is where I give you homework. Study love. You didn't come into this world understanding what love is. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and you read verses 4 through 7 and try to commit them to memory. And these are the things it says. Love is patient. 
Love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. Love keeps no record of wrong. There's a whole list of things in there. Every woman comes into this world understanding why all those things matter. A man looks at that text and can't completely understand because there's the way men talk to men and there's the way women talk to women and then there's the way that men and women talk to each other and then it really gets all jumbled up right there. Okay, so guys, just remember that. Emphasize oneness. Be open. Let her see you trying to understand her, communicate loyalty, esteem her, and study what love means. Okay, how can a wife show respect to her husband? Okay, gals, um, remember the whole thing that we talked about just a minute ago, in all the scriptures, the one thing that was addressed to the wife, there was only one point made to the wife, and the one point that was made to the wife was love, I mean respect your husband. See that she respects her husband. All right, recognize his need for accomplishment. God wired the man in such a way that he needs to be able to accomplish, and he can't succeed unless he gets done with the task. I hear this from women a lot. I don't know why guys have got to celebrate every time they do something. Man makes a touchdown on the football field. What does he do? He jumps up and down. He hollers. He's excited. He made football because he's had a conquest in this particular situation. Wife goes off to the mall. Man comes home and he's washed the dishes and she comes in and the kitchen is clean and she comes in and she looks at the kitchen and she walks out the door. And man says, you don't care that I wash the dishes? No, I just didn't want to praise you for it. The reality is, is he's built for accomplishment And just like you don't feel loved on Valentine's Day when he doesn't tell you that you love him, that he loves you, he feels that you neglected this thing that he's done right here in this situation. That's why after he gets through cutting the grass, he sits back and he looks at the grass. And he's thinking in his head, I wish the rest of the neighbors could keep their yard looking like mine. They would look good, you know. Okay. But understand that. Why is a man that way? God made them that way because it pushes them to accomplish it. God told Adam to tend the garden. He didn't tell him. The second one is know that the husband desires to protect his family. God wires a husband in such a way that he wants. Now, wives get really upset early in a marriage because the, something will happen and the man will bow up and step in front of the wife like he's going to whoop somebody who just said something to her wife. And the wife says, oh, you silly, silly boy. You sit down and you don't do that. You don't need to be acting this way because, because this is just terrible. Well, what you did is you just hugely disrespected him and you stopped him from doing the very, very, one of the very things God called him to do. Now, I'm not going to ask for raised hands on this one, but if I had a nickel for every man that owned a gun at Richard Heights Baptist Church, I would have a lot of nickels. Okay? But you know what? A man will buy a gun and decide his gun's not the best gun, so he'll go buy another gun. And then he'll go and buy another gun because he wants a better gun than the gun he's got. And then he'll go buy another gun. In fact, I'm willing to say, if y'all gave me a nickel, if I put a nickel tax on every gun that was owned by women and men at Ridgely, I probably could just go ahead and retire right now and not have to work again. Yeah. But the man does that because God has wired him in such a way he's supposed to take care of his wife. And this, this, Watch this. Next time you and she go to New Orleans or Atlanta or, or New York City or wherever you go and you start walking down the, 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 you walk down the street and then you cut in between these two buildings and you get in between these two buildings and it's kind of dark and it's feeling a little eerie or something like that. You white ladies watch and see if you don't. Do like this. And what you want is for him to do like this. That's a natural response to a God-given thing. The man is thinking, I wish I had my AK-47 right now. I'd feel a whole lot better. The woman said, Lord, help him protect me. You need to take care of me. Because that's the way God designed the marriage to be. Okay, so uh, know, know that he's called to protect, protect you and don't diss him when he does that. The third one is this. Let him lead. Wives must always share what they think in the discussion-making process in the family, right? This is going to be hard for ladies to comprehend, but this is in the Scriptures, so I can back it up with Scripture. God, at the end of the day, after you make a decision, God will hold the man responsible for the decision, even if the wife made the decision. So what you need to do is, before y'all make decisions, 
Y'all need to talk it out till you come to a conclusion and you both come to the same conclusion. But I'm going to say that probably over the course of a marriage, there's going to be four or five times when you can't come to the same decision. God's going to hold a man responsible for the decision, so let him go ahead and make it. And if he does it wrong, God will fix it, and he'll work it out right. Um, and this, this is why. Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you why. Um, oh, no, let me save that. Let me save that. Ladies, this will help you a lot. If you'll study, like I sent the men to do homework and to study what love is, if you go to Scripture and you'll look up biblical authority and see how God gives authority and what authority is in the Scriptures, you'll better understand how to respond to your husband in each and every situation that you're in. Okay, here's another one for the wives. Trust your husband's ability to analyze. Men think by breaking things down into small blocks of information because that's what their brain needs to do. I can hear the jokes now. Then they develop a plan of action, and by the grace of God, they're able to accomplish their action. Now, what's the difference between a female doing the same thing and a male doing the same thing? And here we go. He analyzes, listen, ladies, he analyzes free of relationship and feeling. He's not thinking about feelings. He's not thinking about relationships. He is aware of the feelings, and he is aware of the relationships, but he is not driven by them. His decision will come out of there not wholly based on feelings and, and relationships, whereas the female has always got relationships and feelings in the process of analyzing things. Why did God do it that way? Because he needs you to see life from both perspectives. And when a husband and wife come together and talk through that, She'll show the husband things he couldn't understand, and the husband will show the things the wife couldn't understand, and then the two of you are ready to make that decision in the end. Okay, here's another one, ladies. This, this is simpler than you think. Be a friend. Be a friend. What's the difference? In, what, is, what does it mean to be a friend to man? As friends, men, uh, as friends, men don't walk face to face. They walk side by side. Even when he does not talk, your presence speaks friendship to him. You remember a guy by the name of Job, and Job lost everything he had except for his wife. And then what did his three friends do before they did anything else? They came and sat with him for a week without opening their mouth. And everything was good until they spoke. If they'd have stayed quiet, it'd have been a lot better for Job. But you see, men can go fishing and fish for eight hours and come home and the wife say, well, what did Bob have to say when y'all were fishing? You say nothing. She thinks, you just don't want to tell me. No, you mean Bob didn't say anything. We talked about the lure. We talked about the one that got away, and that was it. There's no real conversation because that's the way men operate. They know they just step, accept each other. Okay, here, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a last one for the women. Honor his need for sex. A man will equate, and this is, this, I think this sentence helped explain it, and if you want to, we'll come by, uh, you know, with not so many people around, I'll talk more, but. <laughs> <laughs> Honor his need for sex. A man will equate how he feels, how, a man will equate how he thinks you feel about him by the quality of your sexual response to his advances. Now, if you want to get more on that, we, we can't do that in a, a room with teenagers in there. Okay, I close out this message by saying this. Guys, love your wives just like Christ loved the church. It starts with you and it finishes with you. You are the key element that God is holding responsible for your marriage to grow. Wives, respect your husbands. Don't treat them like Rodney Dangerfield. Y'all remember Rodney Dangerfield? What did Rodney Dangerfield not get? No I don't get no respect. I went to a dog show when I was three years old. I won first prize. I mean, he was always dissing himself because he just never got any respect. Ladies, if you don't respect your men, that wrath is coming out one day. Guys, if you don't love your wife, she'll feel scorned and she'll leave one day. God, give us ears to hear eyes to see, and minds that conceive what you have.